The Naval Academy Museum presents a history of the Navy in 100 objects. Standing high above the Naval Academy across the Severn River is our unmistakable object for today. It's actually a group of objects, a trio of red and white Eiffel Tower shaped radio towers. These are all that remain of a massive complex of towers and wires that covered over 200 acres during the early part of the 20th century, all the way to 1999, with the longest tower nearly a quarter mile high prior to its 1999 demolition. Last week, we discussed how the first Naval Aviation Training Ground was located at Greenbury Point, and how less than two decades after the birth of aviation, the Navy had trained nearly 2,000 pilots, and the adoption of the airplane by the Navy was well on the way to changing naval combat forever. At the same time the Navy was learning how to fly, it was also exploring another scientific revolution, wireless communication, and, just as naval aviation had its birth at the Naval Academy, so did naval long-range communication. Even prior to the groundbreaking work of Guglielmo Marconi in the early 20th century, the Navy had embraced the concept of wireless communication and was actively working to develop it. Unlike in aviation, there was no doubt in anybody's mind about the value of being able to communicate with ships at sea, which until the 20th century had been impossible. The development of radio occurred rapidly, and the Navy led the way in exploration of the electromagnetic spectrum. Within 40 years of the development of the first naval wireless communication systems, radar had been invented, and the concept of centralized command and control could be realized. This would cause a distinct culture shift from the independently operating naval missions of the previous 150 years. These major developments in radio communications would be followed by satellite communications, and shortly thereafter, with the development of the global positioning system. By 1912, Lieutenant John Rogers, who in our previous episode had been the first aviator to take off from the Naval Academy, also became the first aviator to communicate from an airplane to a ship. Four years later, in 1916, Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels received a radio telephone call from the USS New Hampshire while he was in Washington, D.C., marking the first ship-to-shore radio conversation. By the time the U.S. entered World War I, the need for transatlantic radio communication was clear, and construction was begun on the facility at Annapolis. All of these developments were driven by naval innovation, and in particular, by Admiral Stanford Hooper, known as the father of radio in the United States Navy. Naval Academy Class of 1905, Hooper guided naval communication development from the early 20th century until his retirement in 1943. Today, we are joined by a trio of experts, Thomas Cutler, Naval Institute historian and author, Jim Cheevers, senior curator of the Naval Academy Museum, and John Shorp, retired senior antenna mechanic at the Annapolis Complex until its destruction in 1999. His interview was part of a longer documentary produced by 100 Objects cameraman and editor Matt McMahon in 1999 when most of the towers were demolished. First, we go to Tom Cutler. The, uh, the towers at Greenberry Point have long been a landmark at Annapolis. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them were taken down. There are a few remaining, but it used to be a sea of red lights uh, blinking at night, which was kind of a comforting feeling that as you're coming back to Annapolis, you knew you were getting close when you could see them. Uh, they're across the river from the Naval Academy at, at uh, Greenberry Point at the Naval Station there. Uh, they served a very useful purpose in their day. Um, these were antenna that actually were able to transmit low frequency signals. Um, and the advantage of a low frequency signal is that it, it travels worldwide, ultimately. I mean, these, these signals stay within the atmosphere because of the low frequency, and therefore you can bend them around the Earth and get them to far, far distant places. Um, high frequency communications, of course, either go off straight off into space, uh, uh, once the Earth uh, curves away from them, or some frequencies will stay within the atmosphere, but they bounce. They will hit up, up on the uh, upper layers of the atmosphere and bounce down and can travel great distances that way. But unfortunately, there's what we call skip distance in between as they're bouncing up and down. If you're in between one of the, the areas where it's not being received, uh, 
um, you're not going to get the communication. So the advantage of low frequency was great and it was used for primarily for submarines. Uh, the submarines had to travel all over the world and be in distant strange places and so forth and they would surface at certain predetermined times and receive their communications. Um, often these communications, by the way, were sped up, put, put on tape recorders at a high speed to uh, uh, so you could compress a whole lot of information and then on the submarine they could then slow them down and get the, the signal out that way. So it was get a lot more information transmitted over a, a shorter period of time. Uh, uh, Jim Chambers here at the U.S. Naval Academy and today we're going to discuss the uh, Navy's high-powered radio station that was here in Annapolis from 1918 to 1994. Uh, this was the primary uh, communication facility for the Navy for sending messages to all ships at sea and naval activities around the world for many, many years. It was a high-powered, low-frequency station, uh, 231 acres at Greenberry Point here in Annapolis. Here on Greenbury Point, the U.S. radio station Annapolis was conceived in 1917 to provide reliable communication between the United States and Europe during World War I. The plan called for the United States to build a high-power, very low-frequency station in the vicinity of Washington, D.C. and Lyon, France. This was to ensure communication between the United States, France, and England in case Germany tried to disrupt the communications cabling. The mission of this facility was upgraded to include higher radio transmissions in 1930. Beginning in 1941, the facility was upgraded with a higher kilowatt transmitter, which caused the facility to become a primary transmitting station for the deployment of military units. Between the 1960s and 1970s, many of the communication systems at the facility were upgraded with more advanced technology. The latest major evolution was in 1969 to 71, when it was changed to a modified Goliath antenna. Um, most of the old towers were uh, uh, decommissioned at that time and uh, taken down, and new towers were put up, and the, the antenna system was reconfigured for the very low frequency uh, broadcast. Uh, the VLF uh, frequency was 21.4 kilohertz, and that was the frequency used to talk to the nuclear subs which uh, can pick the signal up 65 feet below the surface of the water. So they don't have to trail an antenna on the surface, which um, the wake could be picked up by satellite. By the way, it was a very highly uh, guarded facility. Um, you really had to have an appointment to enter. They had Marines standing guard on it. But it was very obvious uh, where it was because of its enormous radio towers. Uh, there was one tower of 1,200 feet, one of 800 feet, uh, I think uh, five or six of 600 feet and 36 smaller towers. Uh, it was a pretty impressive facility. Uh, when it was turned over to the Naval Academy in 1994, uh, unfortunately I remember asking Admiral Lynch why he had to do, eliminate the towers and he said, Jim, well they turned it over to me but they didn't give me any budget to maintain those towers. And those are expensive and of course a safety factor. Uh, and so they actually blew up the towers, uh, all except for three uh, that they uh, have maintained and uh, kept for historical purposes and also for landmarks, because I'm sure a lot of sailors coming up and down, navigating on the Chesapeake Bay, use those towers as landmarks, as they did in the old days, the old mulberry tree at the original Naval Academy in 1845. As the Cold War diminished, the need for this redundant facility disappeared. Thus, this brought an end to a historical era in naval communications. Currently, the towers remaining on the peninsula serve as landmarkers for ships sailing into the Chesapeake Bay as well as planes flying above. The government of Anne Arundel County also utilizes these towers for local communications. Oh. 